Welcome everyone to uh, the third edition of Historic Preservation Month webinar led by Britton Bostick. Thanks everyone for your time today. Uh, we have an interesting topic that Britton's prepared for us. My job is to help make sure um, things run smoothly, but then also if you have any questions or answers, I'm also monitoring the chat and the um, raise your hand function. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Britton. Thanks, Nat. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Britton Bostick, the Downtown and Historic Planner for the City of Georgetown, and we are celebration, celebrating Preservation Month. So hopefully you've been able to join us for the previous uh, webinars. If not, they are linked on the historic.georgetown.org website right there in the front. You can watch the video uh, if you missed out. Um, if you're back again, thanks so much for coming back for week three. So we're celebrating Preservation Month because this is the National Celebration of Historic Preservation. This got started in the 1970s and over time um, has really grown into a large scale effort to recognize, appreciate, uh, and highlight our historic places. So we're doing that online this year uh, just because of the COVID situation, um, but hopefully um, before too long, we'll be able to start seeing each other in person again. And until then, We'll provide you with some fun and hopefully interesting content uh, as we go through the rest of May. So this week I'm talking about pro tips for research and Georgetown's first known female real estate developer. So I found out about this woman while I was doing historic research and I'm going to lead you through a lot of the pathway that I took um, to get there. So hopefully if you're interested in doing your own historic research, you can come across some great stories. We would love to hear about them and love to hear the information that you have. But as the historic planner, I do quite a bit of research uh, to understand historic properties. I am housed in the planning department, so the planning department does a lot of things, mostly around um, development and kind of the big picture uh, projects. Uh, if you can think of it that way, we don't do building permits, but we do a lot of the work that happens before you get a building permit. And that includes certificates of appropriateness. Uh, so those are specific to properties in our historic districts and sometimes our historic properties outside of the historic districts. If you need to get hold of me, you can email me. Uh, it's down in the bottom left corner, britton.bostick at georgetown.org. You can also give me a call at 512-930-3581. If you need more information from the planning department, uh, historic.georgetown.org is how you link to the information for this webinar, but you can also check out planning.georgetown.org uh, and then housing.georgetown.org, also uh, an important part of planning work. And if you're curious about um, when a, a city meeting, a public meeting will be held, our city council, our planning and zoning commission, historic and architectural review commission or others, just go to agendas.georgetown.org and you can see that information. So pro tips for historic research. Uh, I am not the uh, town's leading expert on historic research. There are a lot of people who do um, this job really, really well, um, both professionally and uh, amateurly. Um, amateur just being you're not paid necessarily to do it, not because it's not a great job. We have some really wonderful uh, researchers in our community. And so part of my job is to understand what is the history of the property, where did it come from? Because if people wanna make changes to a property or if they wanna try to remove some later changes, um, what can we know and understand about that that helps inform those decisions? And so one of my favorite parts of the job uh, is doing the research. So I always start with our historic resource survey. I've talked about this for the last couple of weeks. Still one of my favorite tools is to use this map. And this map is right below where you clicked on the link to access this webinar. Just scroll down and there's uh, a picture of a map with dots on it. And those dots are really important because when you open the map, you can click on any of those dots and you'll get um, a sheet, a survey sheet that tells you about that property. Um, and that's a really cool way to check out. Um, for example, I've got on the right hand, upper right corner of the screen, I've got the Williamson County Courthouse in the center of the square. You can click on that red dot and you can see property information about that courthouse whatever was recorded on that survey. It's not a complete information set, it's just a really good starting place when you're wanting to get an idea um, of how old that property might be, what is it built out of, um, is there anything interesting about it, and there'll usually be some photos. 
So you can search by address in the top left corner. There's a search bar. You can type in a particular address. Let's say you live in the historic district. You want to check out your property. Just type in your address, uh, hit the little magnifying glass and it'll take you right there. So that's where I start. Once I have that information, next step is usually for me, I'll go to the Williamson County Appraisal District and go to their property search function. So property ownership records are public information. They, each county in Texas, all 254 counties have an online database of their properties. Uh, and so there's, it doesn't work quite as, as smoothly as you might think. You might think, oh, it's really easy, but there are actually a few little tricks to this. And so something that's really important that you can get off of the historic resource survey, usually you can get what uh, is sometimes we call the R number. And so this is an individual property identifying number that the county appraisal district uses for that piece of land. And so any information on that land is connected to that number. Sometimes you'll see a property number that starts with a P. Um, that is, uh, that's actually not real estate. You're looking for the R number for real estate. There's also business property that's listed because it's taxable and some other things. You're looking for R numbers. So you can search by an R number. That's kind of the fastest way for me to do it. You can search by an address. You can search by a name, um, all kinds of ways to search. And this is countywide. This isn't just for Georgetown. Um, but when I'm looking for properties, usually city of Georgetown, and then I'm usually using that R number that I get off of the historic resource survey. And so when you uh, find the property you're looking for, and I've used the, uh, the Georgetown Art Center for an example. So this is a city owned property. The address is 109, or excuse me, 103 East 9th Street. And this is the beginning of some information about that property. I can look at it and I can know who the owner is. I can look at it and see some uh, valuations. So, I mean, that's kind of fun, but really when I'm looking through the appraisal district information, I'm looking for something really specific. I'm looking for what's at the bottom where it says sales history. Sales history um, in some counties is also called a deed record history. And if I can find that, that helps give me a jump start on researching property ownership. Property ownership can help me know a lot of things. Sometimes it can tell me the date that a structure was constructed. It can tell me uh, if someone uh, of, of kind of notable Georgetown uh, history uh, owned the property. For the most part, um, and sometimes it's a lot harder and sometimes it's a little easier, it totally depends on the case, but a lot of properties I can trace back to the original uh, deed for the city of Georgetown which was when uh, George Washington Glasscock and Thomas B. Hewlin uh, sold uh, a lot of acreage to Williamson County. And then the, the, uh, the judge at the time, the, the kind of the first Williamson County judge began selling those, those parcels out. So you can really kind of trace a lot of Georgetown properties back to the origin of Georgetown, but you have to go back <laughs> a little over 150 years to do that. And sometimes that can be a very long trail. And so uh, a couple of things about the sales history, it's not complete. And so usually these only go back maybe two, maybe three, maybe five different owners, and then it'll disappear. So maybe that, uh, that history disappears. In this case, it disappears in 1986. We don't have anything listed before 1986. Sometimes it'll disappear in the 70s, sometimes in the 60s, and sometimes it'll disappear much earlier than that. It completely depends on the situation. But what we do know is that um, back in 1986, the Davis Friedrich Funeral Home sold this property, and I'm on a different property than the Art Center, so um, this is just for to illustrate. But the Davis Friedrich Funeral Home sold this property to Heritage Baptist Church back uh, on November 25th, 1986 is when the deed was recorded. And that gives me two numbers. It gives me the volume and the page in the deed record book where that was recorded. So that's really helpful information because I can take that and go to the county clerk's records and look through the deed records and see if I can find that deed. What you can also do is you can see on the two more recent transactions, there's an instrument number. One number is 9626182, and the number below that is 9626181. That is actually a partial number for the county records. Uh, and I'm looking at the years, 
And so um, it looks like 1996 and 1987 were associated. So that number should actually be 19960261821982. It's missing a few numbers. It's kind of abbreviated. And the reason that's important to know it might be a little longer is if you go to the Williamson County Clerk Official Public Records website and you search through the official public records, you have a space right there in the middle that says instrument number. And if I took those instrument numbers and copied them directly over, it would say no results. But if I tell it these instrument numbers are actually recorded by the year, and so it'll be the four digit number for the year, and then a zero in the rest of the number. And so if you'll add those three extra numbers, then it'll hopefully get you the right uh, search result. And so that is like my biggest pro tip that a lot of people don't know may not be familiar with. Sometimes when you're looking through those records, um, you have to know some tricks. If you're looking through the Williamson County Clerk's official public records, um, you can also search by last name um, or you can search by the volume and page uh, where it was recorded. I use that a lot, looking through old deeds and trying to understand uh, what is the information from the deed record? What can I know? Uh, so the volume and page I, I use quite a bit. And sometimes you just have to try a couple of times because you may not, uh, you might not have something spelled correctly or you may not have it spelled the same way that it's spelled in the official public record system. And so when it's searching, it's being really specific um, to your search terms and what the limitations of the system are. So just if, if it doesn't work out the first couple of times, just keep trying. Um, sometimes you have to try alternate name spellings because sometimes people's names were spelled a few different ways um, back in the day. And so uh, I've been able to use the, the county clerk's records to find a lot of deed information. That's where the original deed for Georgetown lives. Um, you can see a copy of it in there. Um, and that's a lot of information, so you can also filter out by year. Um, but I'll show you an example. So I was looking for information on the properties right behind Gus's Drug when I was doing some research. Gus's Drug is located on University Avenue. It's been there for a long time. Um, there's a little commercial kind of area uh, in the middle of Old Town right on University or, or Highway 29. And when I was looking uh, back through the deed records, I kind of had a funny path that led me to a woman named Catherine Hudson. And so you would think Catherine, well that's, Catherine Hudson is a, a pretty straightforward name. Well, <laughs> it is, but um, her name has been spelled at least two different ways in the system. And so uh, if you look up there at the top, I've got a name search that includes any of the following. Hudson Kate, Hudson Kate C, Hudson Catherine with an A, uh, Catherine Hudson, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. They're just all these different ways to potentially spell Catherine Hudson because I was trying to understand what all properties did this person own at any given point in time. Uh, and so I used all possible spellings of her name. It returned a bunch of results and then I was able to kind of filter. So the first couple of results, 1978, 1982, I know that that's not what I was looking for because I was looking for something around 1916. I knew that she had owned property in Georgetown around 1916. And so it turns out that uh, in 1908, we have a, uh, a deed record with the Hudson Kate C uh, selling land in Ron Rock. And then in 1912, we have a deed Hudson Kate uh, selling land to, it says uh, J&O Hudson. Uh, J&O is often an abbreviation for Jonathan. So that would have been Jonathan Hudson. And that was uh, actually a property in Old Town. And then there are some other deeds. And then we have 1916, there was a deed from E.M. Sweet Senior selling a property to Catherine Hudson. And when I looked at the legal description, it said part of block one of the Snyder edition and I was looking for the Snyder edition because um, block one of the Snyder edition is the block that Gus's drug sits on. And so that was kind of exciting uh, and kind of a fun way to show you how some of that deed research can look. Um, another really fun tool that I've recently uh, kind of been alerted to and really grateful to our city secretary's office for cluing me in. Um, we have really, really helpful departments that are always looking for ways to, to assist me doing my job. And they said, hey, we have a copy of this photo of Georgetown from 1964. 
would you like to see it? And the answer, of course, was absolutely. How did I not know we had this before? And so it turns out if you go to records.georgetown.org and path your way through our, um, it's called Laserfish. It's basically a, 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 an online digital uh, library. And so if you go to the Georgetown photos and then photographs, historic collections, and then historic photos, there's a photo listed as the 1964 aerial photo. And it is so cool. It looks like this. And it is all of Georgetown in 1964. And what you can see in this photo, it's, it's a really, really large size photo. So when you zoom in, things are really still very clear. But you can see brand new I-35 under construction. Uh, you can see the Williamson County Courthouse there toward the center. You can see the San Gabriel River winding its way around like it does today. And you can see Southwestern University over there on the right. And you can see that Southwestern University in 1964 was really the east side of Georgetown. And then there wasn't much uh, but farmland after that. And so this is a really helpful resource to me because oftentimes I will uh, zoom in really closely to see if a structure existed in 1964 uh, or not. Uh, and so sometimes we have structures that they look like they were built maybe in the 50s, maybe in the 60s, maybe in the 70s. It can be a little bit hard to tell. Uh, and so this map is really, or excuse me, this photo is really helpful for me to understand what things looked like in 1964. It's a great just uh, kind of pause on our city. Uh, and it helps me know a lot of things that I wouldn't otherwise probably be able to know. So my, my new favorite tool <laughs> that I'm happy to share with all of you. Uh, one of the probably least known uh, ways to do historic research, but one of the most fun also, is that Southwestern University puts their, um, puts their yearbooks online. And they have this fantastic yearbook archive that you can access. You go to archive.org slash details slash Southwestern University. And, um, or uh, I usually just Google search Southwestern University Yearbook Archive, and then it brings up a page. You can click on it. But they have yearbooks all the way back to basically the beginning of Southwestern. So you can go back to 1906 and look at yearbooks from back then, which is exactly what I was doing last week. Um, I got a question from one of the city's volunteers, and they said, hey, do you happen to know where the Price Brothers grocery store was on the square? And I didn't happen to know our Sanborn maps, um, whoops, go back. Our Sanborn maps, um, which y'all have heard me talk about a lot if you've watched the previous two uh, webinars. I really love the Sanborn maps because they tell us so much information, but what they don't give us in Georgetown is they don't give us the business name. And so I had asked, well, do you know about what time that grocery store would have been there? And um, this gentleman didn't quite know, and so I thought, well, Southwestern's yearbooks have ads, and I can check pretty quickly and see uh, if I can find an ad. Sure enough, in the 1906 yearbook, I went straight to the ads in the back, Price Brothers Fancy Grocery and Feed Store. But it didn't give me an address. It only gave me a phone number. Georgetown was so small in 1906, you knew where everything was. <laughs> and almost all of the businesses were right there on the square. So you just would have looked for the Price Brothers sign. Um, and that ends up being what I had to do was I knew it was there in 1906. And we have a great collection of photos from just after the turn of the 20th century. So great photos from around 1908. And I happened to find the sign that said Price Brothers Grocery in a photo from around 1908, 1912. Um, and was able to share that information. Turns out that Price Brothers was in the building that Handcrafts Unlimited is in today. Um, right there on the square on the south side along 8th Street. They're the second building from the left. Um, so we found Price Brothers. And that was a way that I was able to do that um, and help provide that information. So this is also really fun to look through. Um, you can see all the photos of students, of faculty, uh, a lot of buildings in Georgetown and on the Southwestern campus are included in these yearbooks. And so that's a really, really fun way to spend an afternoon or an entire week <laughs> studying through all of these yearbooks and finding that information. 
speaking of Southwestern, um, I am a huge fan of their special collections archive. Um, their staff do a really incredible job, um, both with being available um, to assist and also they do incredible um, archive work. So they help to conserve uh, items and artifacts and documents. They hold a lot of information and collections from Georgetown. And so special thanks to them for helping me out. I'm even using a couple of photos um, from their collection in this presentation today. So they have everything from the Preservation Georgetown collection, which is uh, scanned uh, digital copies of photos they've been working on with Preservation Georgetown. They also have documents and information um, from the Belford Lumber Company, the Griffith Lumber Company, um, the MB Lockett. Um, he had a building, but also there are other materials associated, photography studio collections, just a whole lot of um, things that they keep, including the Georgetown Aerial Photograph Collection from around 1934. And so um, they're not open to the public right now, um, but they are able to assist. And so um, that's another, um, you can look them up, or I would highly recommend if you're on social media, following them on social media, their Facebook page, they post photos of some of their archive materials uh, and some wonderful information about Georgetown. And I really enjoy that. You can also um, submit things to their collection. So if you have materials that you would like to have um, a permanent home, or if you would like to have them uh, included in their archive, available for research and, and available um, for other people to have access to, um, you can also contact them. Um, they're, just go to uh, Southwestern, search for Southwestern Special Collections, it'll take you to a page how to contact them. Um, but anything from photo materials to City of Georgetown publications and directories, postcards, cookbooks made by local community groups and churches, correspondence and letters, brochures and pamphlets, all kinds of things um, they're able to take into their collection. Um, and if you have anything like that or, or know somebody who might be looking to um, have their, have their uh, artifact included in, in an archive, you can contact them and they'll take really good care of it. So on to uh, a story I've been wanting to tell for a long time about Katherine Hudson. I'm still not clear on the correct spelling of her name because it's been spelled four ways by my count <laughs> at this point in deed record. Um, and I don't have a photo of her because I don't know a lot about her, but what I have been able to discover about Catherine Hudson leads me to believe that she might in fact be the first female real estate developer in the city of Georgetown. And here's how I came across this. Um, I was doing research on uh, properties around Gus's drug and trying to understand the history of those. And it's a fun history. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So before um, Ms. Hudson came into the scene, um, that was land that was originally owned by George Washington Glasscock, the founder of Georgetown. He owned a lot of property in this area. Um, and he, uh, when he passed, he uh, sort of gave that property to, he had multiple children and gave some of that to his sons, kind of split things up. And so um, one of his sons then began to sell some of that land. And there's this interesting collection of deeds um, that come from that. Apparently, um, Glasscock's son uh, was in Abilene when he signed a deed for Block 1. And this is really the whole Snyder edition. Um, but Block 1 of the Snyder edition was sold to the Snyder brothers. There were three brothers uh, who came to Texas, um, kind of around the time of the Civil War. They were big into cattle, big into business. Um, we might say that they, uh, they knew how to hustle, <laughs> is how we might describe that. These were um, very ambitious young men. Uh, two of the brothers, uh, especially, um, really had a lot of business interest in Georgetown and built houses in Georgetown, um, one of which is still surviving today, but in a different form and, and then one that we still have with us. And so the Snyder brothers, it turns out, um, had bought property from Mr. Glasscock, but they were already selling land that they had bought from him before they had actually bought it from him. And so what deed records are showing, they probably had an agreement. They probably weren't doing it without his permission, but as far as deed records go, they were selling land in 1883 that they didn't technically own until 1884. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, 
Milan went through uh, a couple of hands, including uh, Mr. Dimmitt. Um, you may have heard of the Dimmitt family. Uh, they have owned a lot of business interests and properties in Georgetown. And eventually it came to um, the Sweet family. And the Sweet family, it looks like, had several children. And Mr. and Mrs. Sweet uh, eventually decided to move from Georgetown to, it looks like they had moved to Oklahoma where Mrs. Sweet died their children were old enough to uh, marry uh, or kind of have lives of their own to some extent. And then Mr. Sweet ended up in, ended up in Maricopa County, Arizona. And that's where he was when he sold um, a property to Catherine Hudson. And he sold it to her for $2,450, which in today's um, money would be about uh, just under $58,000. So $2,400 back then sounds like a lot, but um, I looked it up and it would only be about $5,800 today. And so what we know is that Catherine Hudson bought that property from the Sweet family. And then she also bought other properties in the block. The property that she bought from the Sweet family is exactly where Gus's Drug sits today with the building and with the parking lot directly to the east. But by the time she was done, she ended up at some point or other owning most of that entire block, block one of the Snyder edition right there on University Avenue. And she built a number of houses around that first house that she had bought and then sold those houses. And this is why I'm saying she appears to be uh, Georgetown's first female real estate developer. She was widowed uh, when in 1916 and had a young son when she bought that property from the suites. And then she built a house to the left and a house to the right sold those off, and then by 1929 had built a house uh, immediately behind and also sold that off. And so it looks like she took this land that she was able to acquire and um, developed it with additional houses, sold those to make money, and, and that's, how she, uh, that's how she was able to um, kind of make a living, if you will. And I know all of this through deed records. And so today deeds are not terribly interesting. They don't have a lot of detail, but back in the day, um, especially when these were written by hand or, or kind of typed, there can be some really personal information. I've seen references to um, people uh, being orphans in deeds or the circumstances of property passing from one person to another. Um, sometimes a deed record might mention oh, well, we had to rewrite this deed because the original deed was burned up in a fire. <laughs> That's also happened. And so some of these older deeds, you get some really detailed information. And I'm showing on the screen um, some deeds. Uh, well, I'm showing a deed on the right, but on the left, sometimes when you do those searches in the county clerk records and you're searching by somebody's last name, you can find other information, um, particularly what's known as a mechanics lien. And so that is, uh, in this instance, uh, Catherine Hudson had taken out a loan from a man named A.C. Brady. And from what I can tell from doing a lot of deed research in Georgetown, A.C. Brady uh, uh, would have been a banker because he was loaning out a lot of money to a lot of people. <laughs> His name is on a lot of mechanics liens. And so he would either uh, hold that loan himself or sometimes he would transfer that loan to another um, organization. And in this case, um, it looks like he at some point had transferred this note to the Georgetown Building and Loan Association. Catherine Hudson had borrowed $3,500. And that's um, presumably she had borrowed that money so that she could pay for construction materials to construct one or more houses uh, on the land that she owned so that she could then sell that off. And so um, $3,500, um, so that was maybe around or just under $70,000 that she would have, uh, in today's money terms, that she would have taken out on loan. So that's kind of exciting. So let me show you where this is. Um, I'm using the Sanborn maps, and the bigger map that I'm showing is the 1916 Sanborn map of Georgetown, and I've highlighted the block um, that she, for the most part, owned at some point. And so this is the 1916 map and she bought this property in 1916. So it's a great matchup. We can understand exactly what she had bought. This was a pretty good size house facing University Avenue or Highway 29. You can see up 
just on the right, um, a note, the fitting school, that's where the old Georgetown High School is, or, or it's now the Georgetown Administration Center, the Hammerlin Learning Center. And then you can see on the right of that map is Southwestern's main building. And so um, a lot of you are very familiar with that. Um, so it's sitting kind of right in the middle of Old Town. And where it shows, it shows two houses on this block. We see one larger house facing University Avenue, and that sits on a square that we can understand to be a land parcel. And there's a little mark right in the middle, and it looks like it might be a little line connecting the two parcels, but it's actually the number one because it's block one of the Snyder edition. To the right, you can see block three and then block five, block seven, lots of other numbers um, for the blocks, uh, for the, the subdivisions that were added to the city of Georgetown. But you can see on this uh, south parcel, there really wasn't much of anything, some outbuildings. Um, this does read as a servant's quarters just below the main house. And then some other buildings that may have been barns or stables or small sheds. And then we have another house right there on the right hand corner um, that somebody had built. Uh, and it, it wasn't Catherine Hudson who built that house. It was, it would have been somebody prior to that. And so when she bought the property, she bought the house. And then somebody else had owned that bottom portion, but at some point in time, she did own um, a good bit of that bottom uh, half of the block as well. On the right side, <laughs> I've been looking for a 1925 collection of Sanborn maps of Georgetown for a long time. I think I mentioned in the first presentation that the University of Texas has them, but they're not digitally scanned yet. And so they're not available online the same way that the earlier maps are. The only thing that I've been able to find in Georgetown, I'm going to have to make a visit to UT probably, um, and that'll have to happen when I'm able to do that again, but uh, we do in the Georgetown Public Library, we have a collection of slides, and um, this slide, it's not great quality because I took a picture of it with my phone and, and not with the scanner, so we'll get that sorted out, but hopefully you can see well enough. This is the 19, part of the 1925 map. And it shows that block and it shows you can see that same house kind of there just left of the middle and it shows three other houses facing on a University Avenue. Well, the um, all three of those houses were newly built between the 1916 map and the 1925 map. And so Catherine Hudson had built a house on either side of her house by 1925. And that was still property that she owned. It's still showing it in the same block. At the time, we didn't have the same subdivision requirements uh, for, for lots and building new houses. Um, if you wanted to do this today, you'd have to come talk to me about um, that process first, and I'd be glad to help. Um, but we would need you to have separate lots um, today to do that. And at the time, she just built houses where it was convenient and then sold them off. And so there's some deed records showing who she sold those to. Um, and that would have been, um, so we know by 1925, that was how um, the houses were laid out. Thanks to Special Collections at Southwestern, um, they have these really great photos from um, a flyover of town that happened, my best guess is late fall um, or early winter 1934, so kind of end of the year 1934, um, but we know it was, it was kind of the, um, the earlier 30s based on buildings that are, are visible and not visible in the photographs, and so on the left I'm showing kind of the big picture, <laughs> feel, feel pardon my pun, but on the right I've zoomed in to block one of the Snyder edition and this shows um, basically the houses that Catherine built and so uh, we can see there were those four houses facing onto university. You can see they had really big front yards, you can see sidewalks, you can see um, trees. Now the reason I think this photo is from late fall winter 1934 is because the trees don't seem to have many leaves on them. It looks like all the leaves have, have fallen off. Um, and also there weren't nearly as many trees then as there are today. So we've really um, improved our tree canopy in the last um, 90 years or so. But if you look really closely, you can see um, the four houses that are facing university. And then there's another house that you can see the back of, and it's facing Walnut Street, that street along the west side of the property. I know for a fact that she built that house because it's mentioned in the, in the deed records. And so she had sold that to another single woman um, after she had built it. And I think that house is what the mechanics lien or the building loan was for. Um, is particularly that house. And so um, kind of that was Catherine's block. Uh, that was a block that she had developed uh, kind of starting with one house and 
Um, to my knowledge, she lived there uh, for quite some time. I don't have a clear record of, of when she was no longer there. And so a couple more photos that we have um, from that collection at, at Special Collections at Southwestern. <laughs> I like this big photo because you can see the shadow of the plane as it flew by. You can see some of these houses um, that were facing university. The two houses in the foreground um, that are looking at you are no longer there. Um, that's where the Georgetown Hospital ended up going. So the house that you can see kind of prominently in the middle, that was Georgetown's hospital at one point in time. But if you look on the far right of that big photo, you can see the back of one of the houses that Catherine built. It's not the original house. Um, I'm not able to get a close up of that, but that's the back of uh, the house that she built. And that's right where Gus's drug is today. And so um, if you look at the kind of the blown up image on the right, very similar to the other one, but a little different angle, you can see um, a lot of the construction activity that she'd been really busy with in the back of that house. So that, uh, that house is one that uh, helps me to show you one more uh, kind of trick that I have uh, if you're doing some research. So Google Street View, um, if the Google cars have, have been around for a while in your neighborhood or in one of these neighborhoods, you can look it up, you can search for a property on Google Maps and you can uh, go to the Street View and then in the right hand corner, uh, sorry, upper left hand corner, you will see um, a little box that gives you the address. And if you look in the bottom, there should be a little, it looks like a timer, and it'll give you the years and the months that the Google Street View vehicle drove by. And it turns out that we have photos of this block um, from all the way back to 2008. And so that was a little bit of a crazy photo. It was somehow tilted sideways. I don't know if they were up on two wheels in the Google vehicle um, being real crazy, but the 2011 photo was the clearest. So this is a house that's no longer there. Um, but in 2011, uh, you could see um, this was the house that, that Catherine Hudson built probably around 1929. Um, and so it was sort of uh, kind of the last remaining um, house uh, that she may have built um, from what we can tell because over time, um, part of that lot developed into commercial property uh, and some of those houses were removed. Um, but this is kind of a, if you ever uh, are looking around historic districts or historic neighborhoods, there's a very good chance that you could see the changes that have taken place in the streetscape if you check uh, that, that street view timeline and see if there are previous dates uh, that there may have been photos recorded for that area. And so um, if they're, especially for downtowns that have um, experienced a lot of rehabilitation or a lot of reinvestment, you would be able to see potentially as far back as 2008, and you can see what changes may have happened over the last dozen years or so. And that can be really fun if you're doing a virtual visit to other downtowns right now, trying to see what other towns in Texas look like. Maybe you've been watching a show like The Day Tripper, and you wanna see, um, oh, what does this town look like? Maybe I can't go right now, but I'm curious. Um, you might just check that timeline and see if earlier information is available to you. So that is a little bit of how I do my research, a little bit of how I dig into um, histories and try to understand um, how we got here, how we got the buildings that we have, where, where did they come from, who did they come from, um, and then when, a lot of times if I know when they were constructed, it can tell me a lot about how they were constructed and what materials were used. Um, so it's, it's a really enjoyable for me, a really enjoyable part of my job and one that um, I hope other people are able to, if they have an interest, able to do, and just know that you have a lot of resources in Georgetown available to you. And I'm always answer, um, happy to answer questions. Speaking of, um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those. If, if you need some more specific information or are curious about how I do something or one of the resources I talked about. Britton, thank you so much for sharing that information. It's a great, um, resources that you have. Uh, we did have a question about um, one of the data points. Uh, someone is asking, did you ever use census data in your research? Oh, um, that's a good question. I have. Um, I've actually used census data. I think the most helpful I've ever found was 1940. 
I was researching a property that I was doing a full archive document for. And so in this instance, I wasn't just trying to understand the history of changes to the property. I was trying to understand who would live there and if it was anybody that we could find out information about. Were they important to the history of Texas? Were they important to the history of Georgetown? Um, and so when I did that, I was doing, uh, so this is kind of another way to search. I was, uh, I was Googling names, <laughs> which, you know, that can get you uh, lost pretty quickly. But in this case, I was, uh, I was doing a pretty specific search, uh, trying to get census records. And so the census goes out every 10 years. Um, census is this year. So if you haven't filled out your census form, please do that. Um, it's really important to our community that everyone be counted. Um, I understand that Georgetown's doing a really good job. I understand that Central Texas, in fact, is doing a really good job. But if you haven't filled out your census form yet, um, it's really easy to do. It doesn't take very long. And that um, does a lot for our ability to understand the, the changes in Georgetown over time. Back when they did a census previously, um, these days it's a little different. But back when they did it before, they were trying to count really just who was in a household. And so in this instance, I was able to determine who owned a property or at least resided in a property in 1940 here in Georgetown. And that was important because the son of the people who resided there ended up being um, quite well known as the principal of a high school uh, down near the Houston area. And um, there was a collection of letters in um, kind of a, a, a the, the portal to Texas history had letters uh, that were written to uh, this gentleman who, when he was a little boy, had lived in this house, and he was recorded on that census, and that's um, how I was able to connect him to that property. So um, that can be really helpful um, if you can, if you can effect, um, kind of successfully search for those records. And that's more if you're looking for people. Sometimes um, I, I'm focused more on when the structure was built and trying to determine that. Um, but a lot of times understanding the people is very important to understanding the place. And that is a great tip um, to search census records. And the census does go back really, really far. It's just sometimes it's hard to get hold of some of that. Great question. Thanks for the plug on the census, Britton. You are absolutely um, correct about uh, the complete count committee that the city has this year and just how important that is. Um, for historical purposes, but then also for the funding that we get from the federal government. And um, the city has that complete count committee. So if there's anybody that needs additional information, just reach out to one of us, uh, Britton or Nat, and we can get you that information uh, on, on the efforts the city's doing to, to collect census data. Britton, I'm not seeing any other questions um, from the panelists, does anybody else have any question, any general questions about the research methods or uh, have any research uh, tools that they would like to share with us? So if you do have any additional information on Catherine Hudson, I'd be very interested to know. Um, I'm always happy to hear um, stories of Georgetown and um, especially how they connect us to the places that we still um, enjoy and protect today. And um, that's so, uh, my, probably my favorite part of my job is telling the old stories. Um, but if you do have questions or need assistance with research, um, I'm happy to help with that. Um, my contact information was earlier. It's also on the historic.georgetown.org website, but you can call my direct line at 512-930-3581. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you. And then um, we do have one more presentation uh, for Preservation Month next week. It'll be on Tuesday at noon instead of Monday at noon. Everybody have a wonderful Memorial weekend. Uh, we'll all take the day off on Monday, hopefully. Uh, and then we'll be back on Tuesday uh, where I'm really excited. I have asked Ann Evans, who's with the Georgetown Public Library, to uh, be a guest uh, on my webinar. Ann knows so much about Georgetown's history. And um, she's a real professional historian. <laughs> I'm a planner, but she's a real historian. Uh, and so what we're looking forward to talking about is the history of Georgetown's railroad and how that produced the downtown that we know and love today. Um, believe it or not, Georgetown was pretty different pre-railroad uh, and that made a big difference. And that's why we want to talk about that. So that'll be Tuesday next week instead of Monday like normal. Well, great, Britton. We've got uh, last week's webinar up posted on historic.doorsun.org and we will work to get this one up uh, hopefully this week 
Uh, is there anything else you want to share with the with the group? That's all I've got today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is so much fun and a great way to be able to tell some stories about our community. So if you have anything that you'd like highlighted in the future or have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to chat with you. Great. Uh, look forward to talking with everyone next week.